When you think of volcanoes in the United States, most people would think of Hawaii, a place where today you can still see fiery hot lava meeting with the Pacific Ocean. But today I stand in another and much less known place where fire met sea. It's a place where ancient sand dunes eventually gave way to a massive inland sea before being whittled down by the elements to a vast canyon land. And as recently as 3,000 years ago was flooded with boiling hot magma. Today it is my great pleasure to read to you several chapters of Earth's history itself. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Milo Rossi, and welcome to the El Malpai National Monument. The bike is fully packed. Oh, glad I started filming over here. We can't have that flapping around. Come on, baby. There we go. So the bike is packed, camp is broken, uh, and it is almost 10.30, which is much earlier than yesterday. And so I'm gonna count that as a victory. Wow, that looks good. Mm. I could make a bum ass wall look great. Damn, honey, that bum this wall looks good on you. All right, let's talk about this. El Malpais is a dramatic location. Today, this region is a national monument whose primary focus is a gigantic lava bed that runs through the middle of a New Mexican valley. The lava flow that runs through El Malpais is a small section of the much larger Zuni Bandera volcanic field. This enormous lava field stretches more than 30 miles long and about 25 miles across, and is the hardened remains of liquid magma that once flowed through a low point in the Rio Grande Rift. Many people don't really think of the American Southwest as being a landscape that is dominated and shaped by volcanoes, but more than 20% of the national parks and national monuments centered around volcanoes in the entire contiguous United States are in New Mexico. This single state contains more volcanic monuments than Arizona, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon combined. And its volcanic history is very recent. Just some of its more notable features are the Valle Caldera, a volcanic caldera that is 13 miles across and was only created just over a million years ago. The state is also home to the largest concentration of supervolcanoes in the United States, centered around the Datil Mogollon volcanic field. And it's a favorite of mine because it has the highest concentration of my personal favorite volcanic feature, the cinder cone. Huge concentrations of these can be found at Portillo Fields and at the Zuni Bandera volcanic field, the topic of today's video. There we go. El Malpais gains its modern name from the Spanish word for the Badlands. And when you stand on these sandstone bluffs and overlook the valley below, it's not hard to see why the conquistadors would call this place something like that. For the valley of the El Malpais National Monument consists of an enormous lava flow. It stretches for miles in a north-south direction running through the base of this valley, with its origin point located about 10 miles to the north of where I am now. Now we're gonna have a look at what the lava field looks like from here, but perhaps the best way to visualize its colossal scale is from satellite imagery. The Zuni Bandera lava field is comprised of about six different lava flows. One of the oldest of these is the El Calderon flow, which occurred around 115,000 years ago. But the vast majority of the flows in the Zuni Bandera are much more recent. The El Calderon shield volcano saw another period of activity around 33,000 years ago. Its eruption created the Laguna flow. And even more recently than that, the Bandera crater created- oh, that's a tongue twister. The Bandera crater created the Bandera lava flow. <laughs> and that was only 
only around 10,000 years ago. But are you ready for this one? No, you're not ready for this one. Finally, an eruption from the McCarty Shield volcano created the most recent lava flow only 3,000 years ago. Making it not only the youngest volcanic feature at the Zuni Bandera field, but one of the youngest volcanic features in the entirety of the contiguous 48 states. Something which truly blows my mind because it means that there were people around when it happened. With a human presence dating back in North America at least 20,000 years, it is amazing to think that there would have been people who actually bore witness to this force of nature. All told, the Zuni Bandera field is composed of more than 100 volcanic vents, the flows of which have covered an area of 2,500 square kilometers in more than 75 cubic kilometers of volcanic debris. So I hear you asking, why is New Mexico a center for volcanic activity? It's not on a hot spot like Hawaii is, and it's not on a subduction zone like Mount St. Helens, Mount Mazama, and Mount Shasta. So why is it that the seemingly unimportant place in the middle of the desert is like hemorrhaging magma? This is all thanks to a rift valley a place where the continental crust is literally tearing apart. This particular rift valley runs from modern-day Leadville, Colorado, all the way down to Chihuahua, Mexico. Today, it is called the Rio Grande Rift, or the Rio Grande Basin, named for the river that runs through its low point that is fed by the drainage basin that it creates. The Rio Grande Rift exists because of a couple different factors. Firstly, the Laramide orogeny. We talked about this in the last episode on the ruins of Guadalupe. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. I'm sure everyone at some point has had like a piece of copper wire or something and bent it back and forth a bunch and eventually just snaps in half. The continental crust is no different. It is plastic, but brittle. And so this up and down pressure by the orogeny created weak points in the Earth's crust. So that was the first ingredient to create the Rift Valley. The second ingredient is the Farallon Plate itself. As that plate has slipped farther and farther into the Earth's mantle, it begins to melt. And as it melts, it creates a magma with a different composition than the Earth's core. As a result, that magma is lighter and begins to bubble back up to the surface. And as it would just so happen, all of that magma from that now melted plate in the middle of the planet is bubbling back up to the weak point that it created about 70, 80 million years ago. And finally, the reason that magma has found its way through the crust here of all places is because the crust here is way thinner. To the east of the Rio Grande Valley are the Sandia Mountains, and to the west is the Colorado Plateau, both with incredibly deep bedrock bases. But the crust of the Rio Grande Valley is between six and seven miles thinner than all of the land around it. And so all of these factors combined have picked this part of the world as a place where the crust of the Earth itself is ripping apart. Cool travel fun fact. If you do stuff like this, you're a dickhead. And thanks to the magma's slow movement across relatively flat land, it created some unusual features. The El Malpais National Monument is home to the longest lava tube in the United States, stretching blow the god tripod over. I don't think it will. But right here. A basaltic wind in this place. Jesus. I'm surprised the people who lived here didn't invent kites. A basaltic tunnel stretching more than 17 miles underground. I guess when you got all that flat land to come across, the wind can really pick up. One of El Malpais' most uh, interesting features is also one that's probably his most hidden, and that is its crown jewel, a 17-mile-long lava tube, being one of the longest lava tubes in the United States. A lot of it is mostly collapsed, but you can get permits to hike through it. It's apparently pretty spectacular. I didn't have time to do while I was there, I was already baking to death in the sunlight and needed to keep moving. There's also an ice cave there, which is pretty cool. An ice cave is where the natural, like, earthen temperature works like a giant freezer, and so all of the groundwater that kind of drips down the walls freezes into big icicles. The cave was originally bought by an innkeeper who would go down there to mine the ice to chill his beer. I'm sure he was probably a real hit in that part of the world. <laughs> Today, the ice cave is actually still privately owned, but you can get tickets to do it. Um, but of course, mining of the ice has been fully discontinued due to how <laughs> intrusive that is. However, long before the Spanish would give their modern name to this rugged and desolate environment, people for thousands of years had been able to find a home here. For a near eternity before European colonization, this land was held sacred to a myriad of indigenous groups, just some of these groups being the Zuni, the Acoma, the Laguna, and the Tanay Navajo.
While this land may seem inhospitable to our western standards, it played host to countless successful civilizations throughout time. As we saw at the ruins of Guadalupe, this part of the world played host to countless different ancestral Puebloan groups. Being highly skilled farmers and builders, groups such as the Mesa Verde and the Chacoan people were able to dominate this region until their dispersal in around 1300 CE. Their descendants would go on to inherit these lands and become groups such as the Apache, Dene Navajo, Zuni, and Acoma. And it was these groups that inhabited the region. Is this thing f***ing tilted sideways? I feel like it is. Hold on. Is it? Sorry if I just totally messed up your shot, Gianfranco. Get absolutely dunked on. And it was these groups that inhabited this region during the first attempts at colonization by the Spaniards. That is, before the Spaniards were brutally defeated by the Pueblos during the Pueblo Revolt. However, it was peace that would not last. By the mid-1800s, the ever-creeping borders of the young United States would reach this region, which, as you could imagine, was not spared of the brutal conquest that they had waged against the rest of the continent. In 1862, the United States Army constructed Fort Wingate, just south of modern-day Grants, New Mexico. The fort was built at the northern end of the Zuni Bandera volcanic field, and right in the middle of Diné Navajo grazing and hunting land. Fort Wingate was built to protect the Navajo, which is why the United States government immediately used it as a staging point for an ethnic cleansing. Fort Wingate, along with its western counterpart, Fort Defiance, were used as staging points for the Long Walk. Now, I'm sure you all know about the Long Walk. There's, it's really something that just gets covered so much in our history classes, and so I'm sure I don't even need to tell you about it. Oh, what's that? You, you haven't heard of it? Huh, you know, I feel like the U.S. should probably teach about the ethnic cleansings that we did on our own land. Milo, you're being dramatic. It was just manifest destiny. You know, like I learned about it in my high school history class. It was like, you know, the, the painting with the sexy lady with the telephone poles. That is propaganda, my friends. So let's talk about the Long Walk. The Long Walk was when the U.S. government, assisted by the U.S. military, forcibly deported more than 10,000 Diné Navajo inhabitants from their homeland in Arizona. They forcibly removed them from their native territory in Arizona and marched them at gunpoint for 300 miles into New Mexico. This forced removal took place in about 50 different individual groups and marches that all came together to the same trail. And as you won't be surprised, it saw the death of hundreds of individuals. Now, I'm not going to beat around the bush. These were death marches carried out on American soil by the United States government. If that makes you uncomfortable and you're not okay with criticizing the U.S., I invite you to go step outside, have a quick cry in your Ram 1500, and then you can come back and join the rest of the class when you're ready to be an adult. Milo, death marches, that's what the n****s did. The US didn't do death marches, they're the good guys. Just one of the stories from these marches comes from a family who was accompanying their pregnant daughter. The story recounts that she was practically unable to walk because of how pregnant she was, and so her family were pleading with the soldiers to halt the group so that she could give birth before they continue. Their captors, of course, refused, and eventually, after asking and asking and asking, they were told that they were going to have to leave their daughter behind. The soldiers then insisted on the family continuing on with the rest of the group and were told that the daughter would be in good hands to give birth and then would be returned to the rest of them. The family was forced to continue marching with the rest of the group, and the last thing they heard from where they had left their daughter was rifle fire. Conservative estimates from the U.S. government say that between two and three hundred of their Diné Navajo prisoners never made it to their destination, either claimed by attrition or gunned down at the hands of the United States military. While the true death toll may never be known, the incalculable suffering of the Long Walk still has ripple effects that are felt within the Navajo community to this day, a shadow of an atrocity committed by those who swore to protect and for which justice has never been served. The Long March is just one of countless ethnic cleansings committed by the United States government, and they are stories that we seem to be far too quick to sweep under the rug. So if there's ever something that you feel like isn't being covered in your history class, that's probably because it's the only thing you actually need to know. I could go on about this, but frankly, this could deserve a video in its own right, and it makes my blood boil. Anyway, it was through blood and bullets that this land was finally stolen and turned into the land that today we know as New Mexico. Ooh, yeah, it's gonna be hard hitting. I'm gonna get some real f***ing stupid comments about that. In fact, some of this land is still in the hand of its rightful owners, with some of the El Malpai National Monument giving way to reservation land just south of here. The 
hundreds of thousands of years of erosion of the sandstone around me has produced an alien landscape where high mesas overlook an enormous volcanic field. But perhaps there is no better place to understand the history of this sandstone than a site situated just a little ways down the road. Now, while technically the feature behind me lies directly outside of the monument, I'm gonna count it as being part of it anyway because look at how cool it is. In the rugged sandstone cliffs overlooking the lava flows is the La Ventana Natural Arch. Now, a pretty understandable question that some may have when looking at this is how? Because it is very unusual to see rock doing something as bizarre as that. Many natural arches are created by water erosion. The sea stacks and sea arches are created from repeated wave action over thousands of years, and many of the arches that we see in the American Southwest were created by winding rivers. But this arch is a little bit different. Rather than being sculpted by rapidly flowing water, the La Ventana arch was created by probably the smallest motion that water can possibly do. That is, of course, the infinitesimal change in size from a water molecule when it is in its liquid form to when it is in its frozen form. When water freezes, it expands. A tiny bit, but enough to have an effect on its brittle surroundings. Anyone with a short attention span who's tried to cool down a beer in the freezer will already have learned this for themselves. The area that we are in right now experiences massive temperature fluctuations, which can be as drastic as 60 degrees Fahrenheit within a day. Now, while stone may seem like an impenetrable force over hundreds of thousands of years of this temperature fluctuation, it will eventually take its toll. Water will seep into the cracks in the rock during the day and then freeze at night. As this happens, it creates spalling, small flakes of rock that will continually chip off as water seeps further and further into cracks, and eventually dislodging enormous chunks of stone which today lie littered at the arch's base. This arch may look fairly unstable, a sort of delicate thing that looks like it could come down at any moment, but it's actually very secure. As I'm sure all of you already know, the arch is one of the most structurally stable shapes, which is why you see it in everything from doorways to enormous gothic cathedrals. So with every little piece of rock that came off of this arch, it was slowly making it more and more stable. And in all likelihood, this arch will continue to stand for many thousands of more years due to its structural stability. On my way west, when I was getting ready to pick up my bike, uh, my partner, one of our friends, and I visited Carlsbad Caverns, and there's a very similar phenomenon happening there, where you walk into these caves that are just inconceivably large, and you're like, how is all this stuff not gonna fall on me? And it's the exact same principle, where once enough stuff has fallen off, it leaves behind something that wants to stay up, because it's an arch. I want you to look at the rock behind me not as the rock we see it today, but as a snapshot of Earth's history. Because while today it may be large sandstone cliffs, more than 100 million years ago it was the shifting sands of an ancient desert. The sands that make up this stone were deposited during the Jurassic period, and at the time this part of the world would have resembled nothing like what it does now. Instead of sagebrush and scrub pine, it would have looked much more similar to the Sahara Desert, a massive hot swath of sand that abutted the shallow western an interior seaway. It would have been a landscape that was dotted with small freshwater pools, small oases which would have seen the visitation of enormous dinosaurs. The sandstone bluffs that surround the Zuni Bandera volcanic field are made out of two different types of sandstone. The lower Zuni sandstone, made up of the remains of a desert from the Jurassic period, and the white Dakota sandstone from the Cretaceous period. The Zuni sandstone is the remains of what was once the farthest south reach of a gigantic desert. And when I say gigantic, I truly mean gigantic. During the Jurassic period, around 200 million years ago, this sand was part of not only the largest desert in the world, but what is in all likelihood one of the largest sand seas our planet has ever seen. It would have been the primary feature of the western part of the Pangaea supercontinent, a geologic feature known as an erg, a massive, sprawling, flat dune field. It would have been something that resembled more the Sahara Desert than the Badlands that it is today, an area almost completely devoid of vegetation. But the thing that it did have going for it was that it was subjected to yearly monsoon seasons. Due to the paleoclimate 
climate of the western side of Pangaea, this desert would be inundated with rain at certain points of the year. While the heat and most of the year being incredibly dry prevented there from ever being forests that would arise in this desert, it did create gigantic lake and river complexes. Here we are located at a southern and low portion of this desert. So while much of the sandstone from this desert is the red Navajo sandstone that is so classic to the American Southwest, this sandstone's a little bit lighter, because this was all of the alluvial lake deposits and fluvial river deposits that came out of the gigantic desert. The Dakota sandstone above it dates to around 120 million years ago, and it is the remains of the sort of first encroachment of the western interior seaway. The Greater Dakota Formation consists of shales, mudstones, and sandstones from different periods of the ocean's history. But some of you will have noticed that a little thing is missing, a little... 60 million years is missing. And you'd be right, this is called an unconformity, a place where Earth's history has been eroded before it could have something built on top of it to protect it. Meaning that between this tan stone and this white stone, you are looking at a missing portion of Earth's history. We can piece together what happened in it thanks to other sites, but in this particular part of the world, there is nothing there. Earth's canvas has literally just been wiped clean. It's amazing to think that the rock we see there was once windblown sand that could have bounced off the back of a dinosaur or gotten stuck in their eyes or something. For human beings, this landscape is inhospitable. It is dry, harsh, hot, and experiences massive temperature swings. But this unique environment has actually proved to be a safe haven for other life forms. Take for example, the Rocky Mountain Douglas fir. I actually have no idea if this is one of them, I just sat down next to it and it's a tree with needles on it. The lava beds of El Mapais are home to some of the oldest Rocky Mountain Douglas firs on planet Earth. Dendrochronology, or tree ring dating, has shown some of the living specimens to be greater than 600 years old, and scientists even believe that there could be several thousand-year-old individuals living within the park's boundaries. So why is this? Why can't we see these massive, almost thousand-year-old trees towering over the landscape around us? Well, the very reason they've made it this long is the reason that we can't see them. These particular trees exist in isolated pockets throughout the lava beds. Because of this, they have been spared from the forest fires that would naturally sweep through this area every ten or so years, allowing them to persist in an isolated environment. However, this immunity comes at a cost. Because while they are likely the oldest living things for hundreds of miles in every direction, they are very small. Don't stink eye me, bitch. You're from Illinois. Their heavily isolated environment has caused them to remain very small, as their tiny environment is devoid of the nutrients that other individuals of the species would have access to outside the lava beds. But that's not the only unusual plant life that has cropped up within the valley. Recently, researchers have found a small, isolated population of heart's tongue fern living within the lava beds, which a fern in a place like this is not all that unusual until you consider the fact that it is the only population of this fern found anywhere in the United States or Canada on the west side of the Mississippi. How it got here? We're not entirely sure. How genetically isolated it is? We're not entirely sure of that either. But I'm sure it's going to be a pretty interesting story when we do have the answers. While some life has wanted ways to thrive here, others have found this environment far challenging. Behind me are the ruins of the Garrett Homestead, a dusty ruin whose silent walls and hearth tell the story of one of the last chapters of American westward expansion. It was constructed in the 1930s as many families went west after the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, but in this hostile environment there was no fortune to be found. For one major reason.
For as long as human beings have called this place home, there has been one abundantly scarce resource, water. Something more important than arable farmland, a lack of water in this environment has made it a hostile place for humankind to survive even to this day. And it's a story which is not only confined to the El Malpais National Monument, because just a few miles north of here is a place where a permanent spring welled from the ground, a place where conquistadors hung their helmets and carved their names into a cliffside, and a place where hundreds of years before ancestral Puebloans congregated to build their homes on the mesa top. It is an oasis with a rock wall that bears testament to every stage of human habitation, and it is exactly where I'm headed next. I'd like to thank you all very much for watching. If you'd like to keep up with my adventure as I work my way across the country, you can check out my travel documentation on my second channel. Link to that's in the description. And I'd like to give a massive thank you to Vance and Leathers for sponsoring this trip with these sick duds. And of course, I'd also like to extend a massive thank you to my creative team who helped make all of these videos possible. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Milo Rossi. Remember to stay curious, stay inquisitive, and I'll see you up the road.